Right. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is well. Um, either, well, most of you are probably at home uh, with everything going on at the moment. Um, I'm loving the universe's sense of humour, the fact that we have absolutely amazing weather, um, despite the fact that we're all stuck indoors. But it, it, it is what it is. You've got to laugh at the irony of it. Um, so really appreciate you um, taking a bit of time out of your day um, to um, listen to me talk a little bit about um, a few of the uh, Azure uh, offerings and resources and kind of give you a little bit of an overview um, about those particular resources that we're going to cover today um, in Azure. So a little bit of introduction. Uh, my name is Chris Kirk. I'm uh, the uh, lead cloud developer here at uh, Ultimate Business Solutions. Um, I'm basically responsible for um, the um, everything to do with the cloud basically uh, with, with, with Ultima in terms of direction, um, arch architectural um, services, um, new uh, IP offerings, all to do with how we position Azure and how we basically make Azure better for our customers and help them um, basically plan their journey to the cloud or, or kind of assist them um, with their cloud journey if they already um, made their way um, into the cloud um, as, as well. Just to say as we go along, um, feel free to put anything in the chat window, put any questions out there um, in, in the in the uh, webinar window. Um, I'll probably leave them to the end um, if, if they're not massively urgent, um, just so we can get through everything in, in, in a timely manner. And then I'll leave a, a few minutes at the end um, if there's any kind of questions um, going on. So without further ado, if you haven't been to uh, one of these webinars before that we've done in the past, um, in light of everything that's going on right now, we're trying to do more of these webinars to get um, more of you engaged, to get more value add for you as well. Um, and basically what we try to do with these webinars is pick a couple of topics um, in, in Azure that we think are gonna be fairly interesting, where you may not know a huge amount about it at the moment because it's either new or it's not something you've uh, you've uh, looked at before. And we try and give a bit, of, uh, a bit of information and a bit of kind of direction around what these particular resource types are and how they and how they kind of work at a bit of at a bit of a high level today. Um, so in today's agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about Azure Migrate, um, which is uh, obviously, um, as it says in the title, is a migration capable service for your virtual machines from on premises, and how you can use this service to assist uh, a migration of virtual machines um, into um, the Azure environment. And we're going to talk a little bit about Azure Firewall and kind of comparative services. Um, to Azure Firewall that exists um, in Azure at the moment. Now, Azure Firewall is about a year old now. Um, when it started out, it was fairly basic. There were a few little things missing, which we may, we couldn't quite recommend it to customers at that point um, until they kind of improved it a little bit. It's got to a pretty good position these days, but it's good to kind of put it into context of um, how this works with um, all those other comparative services um, as well. So. Just to kick everything off, I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction into um, Azure Migrate as the service exists today um, in, in the uh, Azure environment. So Azure Migrate is basically a service that you can use to look at your virtual machines on-premises, either running in VMware or either running in Hyper-V. Uh, you could basically do a discovery around those virtual machines, i.e. you can get performance information around those virtual machines, kind of what's running on those virtual machines. You can do some assessments, i.e. you can then look at um, assessing them and how they would work in Azure, kind of what virtual machine type they would use. Are they suitable for the cloud or not? Is there going to be any problems in terms of in terms of moving them into, into Azure? And then how you actually do that kind of migration area um, as, as well. So they break it into, into three distinct core areas that I'm kind of going to walk you through um, with this in this particular session. So first off with discovery. Um, Basically, from an Azure Migrate perspective, it exists as a resource in your Azure environment. It's an end-to-end -end, um, control plane, effectively, um, in Azure that you can use to go through those three stages from one kind of management pane, which is really, really useful. So there's no darting about between different tooling or, or, or something like that. It's all there in, in, in one place um, in Azure. Um, in terms of compatibility um, for on-premises, we're looking at VMware with vCenter 5.5 or higher. And with Hyper-V, we're looking at Hyper-V 2012 R2 um, or, or higher. This does support VMM if you are um, using that with, with Hyper-V. Um, generally speaking, 
it's actually easier to bypass VMM if you are using it and just use the Hyper-V host itself, because what you're effectively doing is you're just looking at the host and the virtual machines that exist on that on that particular host. And from experience, it's just a bit easier than having to deal with VMM um, it, itself. This does support um, physical servers as well. It does require a little bit more work with your physical servers, but there is support there for it. So you basically have to put um, an agent effectively on that physical server, um, and there's a bit more um, to and fro in with setup configuration, et cetera, to actually get that to work, but it is there for you should you need it. I haven't actually ever done a physical server with this. I'm going to be completely honest with you. Most customers we talk to have vCenter or Hyper-V and they only care about virtual machines. They don't care, they don't have any physical servers that they would ever want to migrate in, the, in this kind of scenario. And the way this effectively works is we, well, not we, but through, <laughs> through the service itself, um, it basically gives you an OVA or a VHD based templated virtual machine. You put that in your VMware or your Hyper-V environment and that acts as a basically a secure proxy to replicate performance data or your virtual machine data um, via that appliance into the Azure environment that's running the Azure Migrate resource. So that's how it replicates data and metadata from your on-premise environment into Azure itself. So that is all secured, basically uses a registration key and it forms a VPN-like um, connection outbound over SSL slash 443. So it's, it's not clear text or anything, anything like that is completely secure in terms of how it's actually replicating that data. And effectively how we are reading in um, performance data, if we just take assessment first before we get onto uh, my, migration, um, there is no agents that exist on the virtual machines themselves. I just want to make that clear because I, from experience, I know, I know what it's like with agents all over the place. It can be an absolute pain in the backside. Um, when you, once you stick the VHD or the OVA template um, in your environment, um, that then basically connects to vCenter or it scans the Hyper-V host and that performs the analysis of your virtual machines for the performance and the assessment phase. And that also is used to actually migrate um, over um, as well on, on, that, on that side of things. So for assessments, so assessments support up to a thousand VMs in one, in one assessment. Um, you can have multiple assessments with multiple different criteria if you really wanted to. You don't just have to have the one assessment um, running in, in Azure Migrate. And this basically can do a couple of things for you up, up front. So one of the big things we find with customers is this is going to do a cost um, analysis um, on, on, that side, on that side of things. Um, it's going to basically look at or, or scan your resources and it's going to translate what that would be um, from a um, cost perspective into the running cost um, for, the, for those particular uh, virtual machines. So it's going to give you upfront how much it would be to run that particular VM um, on, 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 that side, on that side of things. It's also going to give you the ability to kind of manipulate the assessment as well. So it's going to give you the option around settings regarding um, what VM series you want to look at. So say, for example, you don't really want to look at B series. You're not interested in B series VMs, which are the burstable type of VMs. Um, you're really interested in D series or E series VMs, for, for, for example. You can deselect the B series from the analysis. So it doesn't, doesn't recommend that particular VM type during the assessment phase. You can uh, recommend a particular region you want to put these virtual machines in. You can do a little bit of buffering around performance, i.e. you could take the performance that the virtual machine is running and you can kind of add a little bit on top. So you can say, I want to add 10% buffer effectively on top of the performance of that virtual machine when I migrate it. So please recommend me a VM size that takes 10% on top or 20% on top or 30% on top if you wanted a little bit of a, a, a buffer effectively. Yeah, it, 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 is, it, is, it is what it is um, in terms of what it's actually saying. And it, get, it adds a buffer, basically, to, to, to the performance if you were a bit conscious about that. Um, unless you select different, different disk performance as well. So you can look at SSDs or you can look at HDDs um, from, a di from a disk perspective. And more importantly, probably the most important setting here is as is versus right sizing. So what we mean by that is we can take the VMs 
as they're configured on premises from a performance perspective, i.e. if you've got a VM that's got 16 gig of RAM and four vCPUs on premises, I want to have four vCPUs and the same amount of RAM um, in, in, in the cloud when I, when I migrate it. I don't want you to recommend me something um, to, to what it is already on premises. I would just take what it is and, and, and go with that. Alternatively, we can do right sizing with this as well. And that does take a little bit longer for that to happen. So we recommend absolutely minimum time of one week to do right sizing because it has to collate the performance information. It has to look at peaks and troughs and when it's really busy and when it's not so busy to kind of average out what it would recommend. Um, as, as, a, as a virtual machine size. And this is very important when you're working in the cloud because obviously the, the higher spec the VM, the more the running cost is going to be for that, for that virtual machine, where a lot of virtual machines on premises, you're gonna have given it spec just because you can, because you've got the resources on premises, there's no cost to you to putting 32 gig of RAM to that virtual machine over there, where it may not actually need 32 gig of RAM to actually run what it, the task that it needs to um, on, on that side of things. So right size, it can be very valuable for cost reduction um, before you actually migrate a particular virtual machine. So in terms of uh, once we've done the assessment, we can then look at uh, migration in terms of how we actually do that. So for Azure Migrate, what we actually do here, we have two kind of differing migration levels. We have the test migration and we have a live migration. So what we can do is we could take our assessment data, we can push all that information into the migration piece, which is really handy. It means we can just basically funnel all that information in. We don't have to repeat anything or provide anything um, on that side of things. And when, we're, when we want to actually perform a migration or before we actually perform that migration, we can select the VMs that we want to migrate and we can replicate them up to the cloud ready to go. So it's going to do it's going to do a massive um, replication of that particular virtual machine in VMware or Hyper-V using the underlying APIs in Hyper-V or VMware, which is basically the block copying services. Again, there's no agents um, on the on the VMs because it's using the built-in APIs. Once it's done uh, the replication of VM, it's then going to do just basically delta changes until you actually do the the actual migration. Uh, step its, itself. We can define different things here. So we could define, for example, where it's going to go in terms of virtual network or subnet. We could define static IP if we really want to, or we could leave it as dynamic. Absolutely fine. And then, like I said, we have these two steps uh, involved. We have a test migration, which is basically going to spin up a copy of that particular virtual machine, but it's not going to impact on the live virtual machine running on premises. So the idea being, we can do a, a test migration to see if that particular virtual machine will come up in Azure and see if there's any problems or not. In terms of a, if, does it, if we were to do the migration, we can double check everything, and then we can then bin that off if we're, if we're happy with that tick that off, really low risk, and it gives a lot of peace of mind from a migration perspective. Once we've done that, we can then do the live migration. We can actually do the live migration if we really wanted to. So what's that gonna, what that is going to do is it's going to perform a final delta sync on that particular VM. It's then going to shut down that source VM automatically. It does not delete that VM at all. So really important to remember that. Um, and it's going to start the VM up in Azure, and then you can go ahead and you can log on to that and test that to make sure it's absolutely fine. And if there was a problem immediately, it's a, it's a simple case of shutting down the Azure one and starting back up the one on premises again. So there is always a way to actually go back if, immediately if there is an immediate problem um, with a particular migration. So again, it's fairly low risk in terms of, in terms of doing that. So this does use Azure Site Recovery uh, REST APIs in the in the background. So if people were wondering, well, I've seen test migration and I've seen live migration before in, in, in Azure, absolutely right. Azure Site Recovery does do a kind of similar thing. And Azure Migrate uses the same REST APIs in the background to actually perform this function. So some of these things are um, overlapped, um, as it were, in terms of an existing uh, kind of Azure resource um, on that side, on that side of things. So just to give you a couple of things to consider from experience with doing quite a few of these uh, migrations in, in the past myself. So you have to see, I have to remember the VMs 
VM IP addresses are going to change from on-premises into um, Azure. And we have come across quite a few times where that is hard-coded in the actual VM. If you're running the website, for example, and you've got a web.config file, or you've got something in, in IIS, for example, and you've got the IP address hard-coded in, that's a gotcha that you're going to have to consider before you actually migrate these, migrate these VMs. If you do select a particular VM size or performance, um, some customers kind of get hung up on that a little bit. And it is just to just to say that if you find that you migrate it and it's struggling a little bit for performance, it's not the end of the world. You can change the VM size um, after my after migration um, to whatever you want it to be. That's that's not a problem. And it's the same with the Azure disk type as well. If you if you decide actually I think I can get away with HDD because they're cheaper and I don't need the IOPS, but then it turns out well actually um, I think I think I actually need to make that SSD. Not a problem. You can switch between the two of them. That's absolutely fine um, after you've after you've done migration as well. It is important to highlight that migration and disaster recovery, as I've referenced as your site recovery, are not the same thing. So while we can do test migrations and live migrations that kind of match up to Azure site recovery, and I can fail back immediately if there are a problem by literally just switching the VM back on, um, there is no fail back, as it were, um, beyond that point into the migration. So you have to be a bit careful in terms of when you're actually doing these migrations to, to just to just to say that this is not a DR based tooling, i.e. from a disaster recovery perspective, that's a case of my, well, not migrated, but moving the VM into Azure because of a DR event and having the ability to fail that back as part of a DR or a business continuity procedure. This is not a BCP based tool. So you have to bear that in mind um, from a fail back perspective. Certain, certain uh, VMs, um, are going to require a little bit more thought and planning around this. So for example, if I had SQL always on as a two node VM on premises, that isn't going to migrate very easily using this tool. Um, anything that's using HA or is using um, shared disk based clustering un under the covers, generally speaking, is not really supported by this tool. Um, you're probably going to end up actually probably building from new and migrating the data separately if that were the scenario. So just to say it does have a few limitations um, on that side of things. And also bandwidth is a key um, for this particular service. So obviously the more VMs you're gonna be replicating at any given time, the more contention you'll, you'll experience in a, in a particular um, scenario for migration. So we recommend an absolute minimum of 150 megabits a second outbound connection. So this is not gonna go over the VPN, this is gonna go over your outbound internet connection, obviously secured as, as I mentioned, and you're gonna need a reasonable amount of bandwidth to be able to replicate this without actually either flooding the connection um, for everything else, or to not get um, absolutely tons of warnings where it's not able to re replicate that data quick enough in terms of the delta changes that are happening um, in, in the background. So if you've got a very small internet pipe and you wanna have a look at this, you are going to have to take that into account as well in terms of um, increasing that potentially. And so I very want to quickly highlight before I move on to firewalling is we Azure Migrate it is a really, really amazing tool that we think is a brilliant thing that Microsoft have released. They're working really hard on it, but it does fall short in a, in a few places, i.e. when you migrate, you need an environment in Azure and that is completely out of scope of this tooling. Testing, you didn't, when we do a test failover or a test migration, you need an isolated failover environment that, that on-premises can't see, so there's no kind of um, impact on that. That isn't included with this tool either. You have to provision that and design that yourself. There's no health checking based services um, for that. And you have to think about ancillary services when you're actually migrating into the cloud, such as backups, DNS, outbound internet connectivity, domain controllers, for, um, KMS services et cetera, et cetera. These are the areas that aren't catered for on that. And I just wanted to quickly highlight that we at Ultima have, have kind of recognized this and come up with a little bit of a tool around the SMB to mid-market customer. Um, and we call this autonomous migrate. So we use Azure Migrate APIs at the core of this, but we give you a Azure environment upfront for free um, to migrate into if you don't have that already. So there's no upfront cost, there's no setup cost for it. We'll give you a complete 
best practice enterprise grade Azure environment to migrate into. And then the only charge you're going to have is for actually the, just the running of that service and the monitoring and management of that service um, through a, an additional tool called Autonomous Cloud that we add on to all of these services as well. So we take those APIs and we basically enhance those APIs to, to what we feel it should be in terms of making it a complete service. And we give you full documentation, we give you automated health checking, automated validation in terms of your, your test failovers, and we basically lower the risk um, on that side as well. So for the technical people on the call, that are technical people that are, that are uh, sorry, technical orientated on, on the call, um, this is effectively what we give you at a very high level as an architecture to start off with. And what that basically gives you is uh, full firewalling, uh, full backup services, connectivity to on-premises. We give you management UIs, dedicated restore and testing areas, dedicated secure jump boxes, um, secure password vaults, um, assessment services. And we basically do this all through automation and we can give you the, this environment ready to go in less than three hours if you, really, if you really wanted to, as opposed to a standard engagement, which is about eight days usually to build this out. Uh, by hand from scratch. So I just want to very quickly highlight that and if that is interesting to you in terms of you're after an Azure environment and you want to know more in terms of uh, about that particular service, so, uh, 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 Autonomous Migrate, um, then feel free to get into contact with your account manager and ask a little bit more about that and how we can assist you into the migrating um, into the cloud if you're thinking about that right now. And very quickly, because I know I'm running a little bit behind, um, so much to talk about. Um, <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit, about, obviously, about firewalling as well, um, specifically around the Azure Firewall Service, but also how this relates to other security options that we have in Azure. Because I felt it was very important to highlight the differences in terms of these key security areas um, that we're probably seeing every day in Azure. So I want to highlight a little bit about um, web application firewalls or, web, or application gateways, as they're known. Um, network security groups, and also third-party firewall services um, as well from the likes of uh, Palo Alto or Checkpoint or Cisco or, or any other kind of third party that have an appliance available um, in Azure. So just to start with the kind of the, the most common security feature that you'll see in Azure is network security groups or, or NSGs. Um, these are free to use. They're fairly basic in terms of um, uh, as firewalling in, in air quotes as, as it goes um, in terms of it allows you to configure port and protocol source ip destination ip protocol um, and then you can basically allow or deny um, based on those uh, five tulip based uh, settings so you can secure this against the nick the uh, of the azure virtual machine or you can secure it against the subnet of a particular virtual network we always recommend the subnet is best practice because otherwise if you start creating an energy for each vm it's going to be impossible to manage uh, moving forward and you'll get into a bit of a mess trying to keep up with everything. And that's kind of where NSGs have their limitations. They're, they're great as a, as a first foray from a security perspective, but there's no centralized management. Um, you end up quickly drowning in our opinion um, in terms of if you have a lot of NSGs, it only requires one mistake to open something up and you'll end up managing them all over the place and there's no central way kind of, of doing that. Um, at the, at as it, as it stands um, in, in Azure. So in terms of uh, an application gateway as the next level up, so if you have um, VMs or you're using PaaS web apps, for example, and you have uh, a website or a web application that you're fronting to the outside world, then application gateways are an absolutely great service from Azure that basically secure as like a layer seven load balancer in front of your VM or web app and also offers um, additional um, security um, on top of that as well. So it uses um, OWASP-based standard standardization um, to block things like SQL injection or cross-scripting attacks um, and all those other things as well uh, that relate to that. It offers SSL-based termination, does round-robin, does content-based routing um, and cookie-based session affinity, all the stuff you would expect from a particular kind of application level firewall um, for, on, on that side of things. To be honest, these only really fit into the scenario of websites. That's exactly what they're designed for. They're not designed for your overall um, inbound, outbound based security. So if you have um, a lot of VMs in Azure and you want 
and you have users using those VMs and you want to kind of monitor inbound and outbound um, connectivity in general, then application gateways aren't really designed for that. Uh, just to kind of highlight that, these are purely designed for your websites and your web applications on that side of things. And that neatly moves us onto the Azure Firewall service. So this is a platform-based stateful firewall that is very similar to your third-party network virtual appliance like Checkpoint or Palo Alto, etc. The advantage this gives you um, over uh, um, the third-party VMs is they are virtual machines that exist um, in, in the cloud. This is not. So this is highly available by default. There's no patching requirements for this. It, most NVAs um, or virtual appliances run on Linux, um, but they still require patching here and there from a Linux OS perspective. Um, it scales um, unrestricted seamlessly without you having to do anything in terms of um, capability. So again, there's no right, there's no kind of right sizing or having to change the VM size for, for, for whatever reason in terms of getting really busy. It's going to have all that for you. And this is basically going to act as a centralized way of um, managing your inbound and outbound uh, connectivity um, in, in Azure its, itself. So this does have um, threat intelligence built into it. So it, it is going to do a reasonable amount of um, things like port scanning uh, or, or anything along those lines. It's going to det detect that and drop it by default. And like a standard firewall, it's going to allow you to put rules in as well in terms of you, what traffic you want to allow, what traffic you want to deny, and it does support FQDNs as well as IP addresses as well for, on that side of things as well. Um, for those uh, of, of a, certain, a certain business orientation, this supports PCI, uh, SOC, and, and ICSA compliant. And the way you pay for this that particular service is per hour, and you pay for the amount of data that is consumed by the service inbound um, and outbound um, as well. Just to highlight, um, this doesn't have any VPN-based capabilities built into it. You have to use the Azure VPN separately to this. So um, unlike a third-party product, which may have a VPN or a, a, an endpoint built into it, that doesn't exist with this particular service. You have to put that in separately. And that neatly moves us on to um, a network virtual appliance or a third-party uh, firewall uh, service. So this is the likes of Cisco, Palo Alto, Checkpoint, Fortinet, for, for example. And this is basically doing the same thing, but this is where you're maybe an enterprise customer and you want to have a bit more in depth in your security. So you want to have things like deep packet inspection. Um, you want to have VPN capability built into the product. You want to have very detailed inspection capability um, on, on that side of things um, as well. And it may be a case of you're using uh, Palo Alto or Checkpoint, and you've got a department that you've got existing skills on premises with these particular products, and you want to extend those skills into the cloud. That makes absolute sense uh, to us, and it gives you the ability to just carry on using those skills and that experience that you've already got on, on premises, and you can use that in the cloud, and it works exactly the same exactly the same way. As I mentioned, these are also VPN capable as, as well, most of these products, but where this kind of does differ a little bit to the Azure Firewall is you're not getting any SLA from Microsoft on the actual product itself. And this does rely on virtual machines um, under the covers. So you're still using, you're still having to manage HA yourself through Azure load balancers or multiple virtual machines. So that does get very complicated very quickly. Um, if you need more performance, you're gonna have to right size those VMs and maybe there may be a little bit of downtime to do that. Um, and it does mean you have to patch those VMs um, as well. Um, so it does have a little bit of a downside to it in terms of you're still dealing with a very, um, a very kind of traditional deployment um, as it was. There's still a lot of management overhead um, doing it this way as well. And from our experience, a lot of these NVAs, um, they're, they're taking what they know on premises from a VM perspective and they're using it in Azure. They're not really built from the ground up to work in Azure. They're just adapted to work um, in Azure. Now that's nothing against the security side of things. That's absolutely not. That's more just to say how the architecture has come about is they're just kind of retrofitting what they already do on premises and then using that um, in Azure itself. So just give you a little bit of comparison. Um, obviously NSGs are pretty basic. There's no kind of inspection capabilities or anything like that. Um, Azure Firewall um, pretty much covers everything across the board. Um, deep packet inspection is coming on the roadmap. Um, so we want, well, it does do threat detection um, as well. Um, right now, um, 
deeper inspection is on the way. Um, next gen firewalls um, do pretty much everything across the board, um, except for uh, monitoring and management um, is kind of on, on the roadmap um, so for that side of things. Um, and uh, it's pretty much the same with um, web applications as well, even though they're designed for your particular web applications. And just very quickly to highlight cost. So for, for example, the checkpoint um, is always going to work out more expensive, uh, and that's purely because you're paying for the compute running costs of those virtual machines, as well as the licensing to use that product. That's why it's more expensive um, from that perspective. The Azure Firewall with a VPN gateway is, um, is kind of second behind that um, in terms of cost, but you're not paying for, for HA or scalability that's built into the product, as opposed to the third party vendors, you may have to spin up more virtual machines and add more compute costs. So the cost could potentially go up where they're not going to really with the Azure firewall side of things. And the um, application gateway with the application firewall is, is pretty much the cheapest option out of the three, but that's more, like I say, aimed at your web applications um, as well. So very quickly in, so very quickly in summary, so NSGs are great for small and non-prod deployments. Web-based environments are very much suited to the application gateway and the WAF. Azure Firewall is great for centralized management on your larger production environments. And next-gen firewalls are great if you want to follow that existing investment and you're kind of more an enterprise-based customer that needs more deep packet inspection and more security bells and whistles um, around that particular um, environment. So that's pretty much it as a quick highlight for those two products today. Um, I hope you found that informative. Um, if you've got any questions, feel free um, to put that um, in the chat. Um, I'll give it a couple of minutes um, on that side of things. Um, if you do have any questions or anything like that in the chat, um, just, to let, just to let you know that um, if you do have any additional questions around this, um, if you want to speak to uh, your account manager, um, at Ultima, and they'll be able to give you kind of more detail around our Azure capabilities as well. We've got some new exciting products coming out from, from Ultima around Azure capability. So I've already mentioned Azure Migrate, for example. We will, um, sorry, uh, Autonomous Migrate that does make use of Azure Migrate in, internally. Um, we also have uh, our Autonomous Cloud um, Azure feature as well. So if you need something to monitor and manage um, your cloud investment from the ground up. Um, we have uh, that product ready to go um, as well. That is backed by our CSP, um, our CSP um, investment. Um, again, if you want any more information um, around a management and monitoring solution for Azure, then feel free to get in touch with your account manager or just get in touch regardless um, anyway um, on, on that side of things. Cool, okay. There's no, no questions um, at, at the moment. That's, that's absolutely fine. If you do think of any questions um, in, in the interim, um, feel free to get in touch with your account manager or just get, I guess get in touch uh, via our standard email addresses. And um, I'm going to put uh, these uh, slides up with our marketing team. Um, and uh, I just want to say thank you very much for um, spending uh, half an hour of your day. Um, and I hope you find it very useful. And goes without saying, um, enjoy uh, the rest of your day. and. Hope you have a productive one. Thank you very much.